Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. When Beverly Cicero was unable to get in touch with her 76-year-old father, Irving, she rushed to his condo to check on him. What she found continues to haunt her to this day. Her father lay dead in a blood-soaked apartment, the victim of a brutal and violent attack. In the years following his wife's passing, Al had finally confessed his truth. He was gay, and he didn't want to hide that part of his life anymore. Despite his age and health issues, he began dating and going out to clubs, having fun and living a life to its fullest. Unfortunately, one of the men who caught his eye was also the man who would kill him. While police investigated similar crimes and tried to make connections, they never could. When they surprisingly got a partial DNA match, state privacy laws wouldn't allow them to learn the identity of that individual. Now, 20 years later, the identity of the killer remains unknown, though police are using every technology available to get his face out to the public in the desperate hope that someone might be able to provide them with the name they have been seeking. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 133, The Murder of Irving Sishera. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the horrifying and brutal murder of Irving Sishera. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also available on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions directly through the website or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 76-year-old Irving Cicero was finally living the life he had concealed for so many years. Then, in a moment of madness, his life was ended in a brutal and violent assault. This is episode 133, The Murder of Irving Cicero. Beverly Cicero was trying to get in touch with her father, Irving, who friends called Al, for two days but had been unsuccessful. Multiple calls had gone unanswered and considering his age, Al being 76 at the time, Beverly was understandably concerned. It was the morning of Wednesday, July 25, 2001, when Beverly, along with her good friend Lorraine, left her home in Palm Beach Gardens and began making their way towards Aventura, a northern Miami suburb. Turning on to East Country Club Drive, the two women approached the Waterview condos where Al lived on the 16th floor. Arriving at approximately 12 p.m., Beverly and Lorraine made their way into the building, taking the elevator up to the 16th floor where they approached Al's door. After several unanswered knocks, Beverly inserted her key into the lock and threw the bolt, slowly entering into a horrifying scene. Al lied dead on the floor, and there was blood everywhere. Beverly later told the Miami News Times, quote, He was there in a pool of blood. I remember standing there and screaming. I leaned down by my father. I wanted to hold him, but I didn't. I couldn't close my eyes for a year without seeing it. End quote. Police received the 911 call at approximately 1220, and officers were dispatched to the scene. Beverly stepped out of the apartment sliding slowly down the wall until she found herself lying face down on the cold tile floor. Angry and heartbroken, she pounded her fists and forearms against the floor, according to the News Times. The 43-year-old had lost her mother just six years earlier, succumbing to a heart attack, and now her father lie in a puddle of blood, the victim of a vicious and brutal homicide. Beverly couldn't imagine who would have done such a thing, 
especially to an elderly man, but the only word she could summon was monster. It was a horrible ending for a man who had lived a complicated and difficult life. Irving H. Sishera was born on June 1st, 1925 in Brooklyn, New York. Al, as he was better known, began working in the food service industry early and eventually became a caterer at high-end hotels in the city and surrounding boroughs. He eventually met and married Lillian Dolgov, a widow at the time who had a son from her marriage, Robert, who Al went on to adopt in 1955. Al and Lil, as she was often referred to, would become inseparable in a marriage that would last for 40 years. Their daughter Beverly came along three years later in 1958. It was a loving environment and Beverly has spoken thoroughly about her close relationship with her parents. Al and the family frequently wintered in Miami Beach, a nice break from the brutal cold of New York winters. With the exception of Robert, he moved back to the north eventually. The family loved Florida so much that in 1967, they finally packed up and relocated. Al picked up a job at the Tides Hotel, a high-class location at the time which drew in top-tier clientele. However, as times changed, so did the environment, and going into the 1970s, Miami Beach had lost the safe and comfortable feeling that had drawn them there in the first place. While Al still loved Florida, he had to make a choice to improve life for his family, and that led them to Emerald Hills, an upper-class area that, while carrying a higher price point, also provided a more secure location to raise a family. Beverly later told the Times News that they had moved predominantly for her to ensure she grew up someplace safe and comfortable. Beverly loved her parents and was so close to them that she ended up living in their home until she was 30. It wasn't a matter of financial stress or difficulty, but a preference. She wanted to be there for them. She wanted to spend time with them, and eventually, when she moved out, she continued that close contact, calling at least once a day, though usually more than once. Unfortunately, this close family would deal with the tragedy of loss when their matriarch, Lillian, passed away in 1995 as the result of a heart attack complicated by diabetes. Al was devastated, and according to the South Florida Sun Sentinel, he left Lillian's hairbrush, comb, and slippers exactly where she had left them for well over a year following her passing. Al was lonely and heartbroken. That much was obvious, but he was also hanging on to a secret, one which he had been keeping for his entire life. Maybe it was the passing of his wife that brought the harshness of reality home, or his own heart attack that required an angioplasty. But at some point, Al decided he didn't want to pretend anymore, and he was going to live the life he'd been trying to avoid for the better part of seven decades. Al was gay, and with the clock ticking and his experience with the loss of life, his own physical ailments, he wanted to live his life open and honestly. Beverly later told the Times News, quote, He was a good father, and he loved my mother. He compromised most of his life, but after mom died, he tried to make up for the 25 years of life that he hadn't been allowed to live, end quote. Al began going out to clubs and spending a lot of time on the beach. One particular club, the Boardwalk, was known as the place to go to see male dancers, according to Hot Spots magazine, and Al certainly spent his time there. According to multiple reports, Al was living life without limits during this time and enjoyed finally being open about who he was and what he wanted. Sometimes he mixed in a little theater, telling guys he met that he was extravagantly wealthy or making up compelling stories about his past. Of course, living life that way can also have its negative effects, and on at least two occasions Al found himself on the wrong side of the law. In one instance, which took place in 1999, Al was arrested and charged with performing a lewd and lascivious act in public. He later pled guilty to the charges. Beverly has since explained that her father seemed to have a particular type of man who interested him, that being described as young Hispanic men. Al would meet a man, sometimes bring them back to his place, or maybe he even went to theirs from time to time, the normal behavior you'd expect from someone who was out looking to date. However, as fate would have it, one of the very men he chose to spend his time with may have ultimately been responsible for his murder. 
The problem for investigators, though, would be in trying to track down who it was that Al brought home with him for that last time. And if they could only answer that question, they'd be able to catch a killer. When police arrived at the scene of the crime, Al's condo, they found an overwhelming amount of evidence. According to investigators, there were fingerprints everywhere and a bloody footprint in the kitchen. A half-drank bottle of Heineken was also found, containing DNA, as well as a partially smoked cigarette, both believed to have belonged to Al's killer. While police entered the DNA and fingerprints into their system, they didn't receive any hits, which suggested that the killer had never been printed or had his DNA put in the system before. In terms of the murder itself, grisly is a rather tame way to describe it. Official reports explain that Al had been brutally bludgeoned with a bronze statue as well as a heavy rock crystal. Beyond that, the killer had also stabbed Al multiple times, leaving the blood-stained knife behind. Police theorized that, after striking Al, the killer likely went through his home looking for money and expensive items, returning to Al multiple times to hit and stab him again, perhaps in an attempt to get the 76-year-old to reveal the location of more valuables, but there simply weren't any. Fred Morris, the lead investigator on the case when discussing the murder, told the Miami Herald, quote, What he did to him was unbelievable, and there's no question in my mind that if we don't catch him, and catch him soon, he will kill again. End quote. The murder, only the sixth to happen in Aventura since its inception in 1995, brought in a full brigade of officers looking to solve it quickly, knowing full well they had a vicious and violent killer who was likely to strike again. Eleven detectives, nearly half the police force, was assigned to the case, and they quickly began trying to gather every piece of evidence they could find. Canvassing the condo didn't yield many results. No one appeared to have heard or seen anything in the days leading up to Al's death, and for the most part, no one really knew Al that well. The manager of the condo later told the Miami Herald, quote, He was an older gentleman, and I don't know if anyone knew him really well. The only sense I get from other people is he was a really nice person and kept to himself. End quote. While initially police would not release any information about what, if anything, had been taken from the condo, they did confirm to reporters that Al's two door maroon 1994 Lincoln Mark 8 was missing from his parking space, and it was believed the killer had driven off in it. The vehicle was later found abandoned in Hollywood, Florida, in a municipal parking lot. Investigators also later revealed that Al's Rolex had been taken. Since police were unable to find any direct witnesses who may have seen the suspect, they turned their attention instead to the condo's own security system, which at the time employed multiple surveillance cameras. Going back several days, police got a look for the first time at a potential person of interest. On Sunday, July 22nd at 10.14 p.m., Al was captured on surveillance video entering the rear garage entrance of the condo. He was accompanied by an unidentified male, described by authorities as being in his 20s with short, dark hair. When the footage was shown to Beverly, she was unable to identify the man and said she had never seen him before. During their investigation of the scene, police were able to discover evidence which suggested that Al had been at a local grocery store two days before his murder the same night as that surveillance footage. A public supermarket on Aventura Boulevard had surveillance footage which showed Al and his unknown companion. This footage, captured at 8.33 p.m., showed Al and the unidentified man buying a six-pack of Heineken beer, the same beer which was found inside the apartment. The final piece of video evidence was back at the condo six minutes later at 8.39 p.m., when Al and the unknown man once again were captured entering the rear garage. An additional piece of video was found from Tuesday morning, showing an unknown man exiting the building at approximately 8.40 a.m., though when this individual was tracked down, police were able to confirm it was not the same person from the previous tapes. Unfortunately, it was a lot to go through, and video has never surfaced of Al's killer actually exiting the condo. Police Chief Thomas Reibel later compared going through the surveillance video as to searching for a needle in a haystack. In hopes of tracking down the suspect, police issued enhanced photographs taken from the surveillance footage to the media. 
Lieutenant William Washa Jr. later told the Miami Herald that it was their belief Al may have picked up his killer either at a local bar or club or perhaps that he met him on the street. Washa went on to speculate that the killer could have been a sex worker that Al had met and it was their hope that getting his photo out would aid in his capture. Police noted, based on the surveillance footage, that the suspect walked with a slight hunch, leaning forward. When asked about the brutality of the crime and the link between Al and the unknown suspect, Detective Mike Giordano told the CBS Miami News, quote, He was beaten with a heavy object about his head and neck area and also was stabbed. This killer was angry. He wanted Mr. Sershera dead. For what? We don't know yet. End quote. Before police had truly kicked their investigation into high gear, they became aware of a similar crime, which at the time led them to believe that they might be looking for a serial killer. On July 26th, the day after Al was found, a maid working at the Radisson in Fort Lauderdale, just 16 miles to the north, discovered the body of 39-year-old Anthony Martellato. Initial examination determined that Martellato had been strangled to death. When the Aventura Police and Fort Lauderdale Police got together, they noted a lot of similarities between the crimes as well as their potential persons of interest. Both men were gay, both suspects bore similar descriptions, and both men's vehicles had been taken by their killer. However, in the case of Martellato, they had a name. Several witnesses reported seeing 19-year-old Adam Azerski checking into the hotel with Martellato at approximately 3 a.m. Just hours later, Martellato would be found dead. While they had a place to begin, Azerski would be difficult to track, as his last known address led to Atlantic Beach, but it was clear Azerski hadn't lived there for some time. Azerski had been arrested six times in the previous five years and was sentenced to three years probation, but he never registered and seemingly vanished. The FBI got involved in the case, issuing a warrant for Azerski's arrest for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, according to the South Florida Sun Sentinel. The search for Azerski, though, would be difficult. It wouldn't be until mid-August when the car he had stolen from Martellato, a red Ford Mustang, was spotted 3,000 miles away in San Francisco. Reacting to this information, the FBI and local authorities began distributing Azerski's flyer around town and at local clubs and bars, hoping someone would recognize him and call in. On August 16th, the FBI received a call from a man who claimed that he'd been attacked by Azerski in San Francisco. According to the Miami Herald, the victim claimed that he had met Azerski at a cafe, unaware that he was a fugitive. After spending several days at the victim's home, Azerski apparently struck the victim with a plaster statue while he was sleeping and then attempted to strangle him. Investigators searched the area where the victim lived and ultimately came upon Martellato's stolen Mustang. While the possibility of capturing Azerski grew stronger, the Aventura police were having their doubts about his involvement in Al's murder, with Detective Fred Morris stating, quote, The evidence that we have looked into already doesn't yield anything towards Adam. End quote. However, the Aventura police were adamant that they did want to question him when and if he was captured. They wouldn't have to wait long. On August 18th, FBI officials located Azerski in Reno, Nevada and arrested him. In communicating with the Fort Lauderdale police, the San Francisco police were able to confirm that Azerski's fingerprints matched those found at the murder scene of Martellato. When Azerski was questioned, He confessed to police that he had killed Martellato in Fort Lauderdale. However, when it came to Al's case, Azerski denied any involvement, telling authorities that he had never met Al, nor had he been to his condo. While Azerski's confession would help bring justice to the Martellato family, his denial of involvement in Al's murder was supported by evidence, which began to make police believe that he wasn't involved. Examination of the public surveillance footage showed that their suspect had tattoos that Azerski simply did not. Beyond that, the bloody shoe print found in Al's kitchen didn't match Azerski. While authorities were waiting on fingerprint analysis to return, they felt safe in saying that Azerski did not appear to be Al's killer, with Lieutenant Washa telling the Herald, quote, 
we've still got somebody out there who did this. It's like winning the lotto to have so many similarities, but not the same person. You can't take similarities to court. End quote. On August 29th, Aventura police confirmed that they had recovered five fingerprints from one of the murder weapons used to kill Al, but those fingerprints did not match Azerski. In response, an artist composite was released of the man they were looking for. Authorities described the suspect as being approximately six feet tall with a thin build, medium length sideburns, short hair, and a scar or tattoo on his right arm, just above the elbow. Unfortunately, though, with Azerski being cleared, they were set back to square one. With no particular suspect to pursue, police had their backs to the wall. In late September, they performed a reenactment of the murder, hoping that it would shed new light on the investigation, but the case was growing cold beyond their control. They had DNA and fingerprints, but no matches, and without that, they had a limitless amount of areas they could possibly be looking. In hopes of finding someone who might be able to identify their suspect, Aventura police released additional footage from the surveillance tapes to the public. Calls were few and far between, however, none of the tips led investigators any closer to their suspect. The case continued growing cold until July of 2002, when a similar crime once again gave police hope that they might finally catch the elusive killer. On June 12, 2002, 51-year-old Felipe Michael Nicholas was found murdered in his Pompano Beach apartment, some 30 miles to the north of Al's. Aventura police became interested since both men had been murdered in their homes, both were gay and preferred the company of younger men, and both had Rolexes which were stolen by their killers. However, their hopes were short-lived as Christopher Gears was arrested and charged with Nicholas' murder and neither his fingerprints nor his DNA matched what they had recovered at the scene of Al's murder. The case began growing cold once again, though police emphasized to the media that they'd never stopped working on it, describing the case not as a whodunit, but rather a who is it, as they believe the video surveillance shows the killer, but they can't identify him. In a bizarre turn of events, Aventura police received a call from their county crime lab in May of 2006, informing them that while they didn't have an exact match on the DNA, they did have a partial hit. The DNA indicated a partial match to an inmate in a Michigan prison. While it wasn't an exact match, it was enough to suggest that the inmate was likely related to the killer, possibly a half-brother or cousin. Unfortunately, when the Aventura police reached out to Michigan's attorney general, they were denied access to the inmate, let alone his name. Now police major Washa explained to CBS Miami, quote, Unfortunately, Michigan has a policy where they will not release any information on the individual whose DNA is a possible match, end quote. Aventura police continue trying to negotiate with Michigan authorities to this day though no major progress has been made. For Beverly, it's been devastating, knowing that the killer's identity may be concealed due to Michigan policies, but rights surrounding DNA have been coming under more and more scrutiny in recent years. Another year would pass before in February of 2007, Aventura police once again decided to reach out to the public for assistance. Through both MySpace and YouTube, Police released the video surveillance footage hoping that someone would recognize the suspect. Police Sergeant Michael Bentalia explained that seeing the suspect in motion might aid in identification, and he can be heard on the video telling viewers to pay particular attention to the man's posture and the way he moves, noting that it stands out against the crowd. The hope was that this would bring back the case into the public eye, and it did for a time, but there were no major leads developed and despite thousands of views, police found themselves no closer to the killer. Detective James Cumby later told the Miami Herald that the video release was necessary, saying, quote, It's just a cold case sitting there. We've exhausted all our active leads early on. End quote. The last major update in the case came in February of 2017. Utilizing the DNA they possessed from the crime scene, Police worked in tandem with Parabon Labs to construct a DNA snapshot 
of what their suspect most likely looks like. According to the Miami Herald, they revealed several details, including that there is a 90% chance that the suspect has fair skin, an 85% chance his eyes are blue or green, a 90% chance he doesn't have freckles, and a 91.92% chance that he is of Northeastern European descent. A computer-generated composite was developed through Parabon Labs, and while that's a step in the right direction, it still leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Aventura Police Detective Tom Mundy told the Herald, quote, We have a face, but no name. All we need is one solid lead. End quote. Irving Al Sishera was brutally bludgeoned and beaten to death 19 years ago in his condo in Aventura, Florida. For all that time, police have tried to track down their suspect, finding DNA that has led them to a relative, and even developing a computer-generated image based on that DNA. But to this day, they don't have a name or a place to search for their suspect. They have fingerprints, they have surveillance footage, and yet they've never been able to solve the mystery. For Al's daughter Beverly, it's been exceedingly difficult to accept that nearly 20 years later, her father's killer continues to walk the streets, perhaps having killed again. Unfortunately, Beverly has slowly accepted that the case will likely never be solved, resigned to a reality that her father will never receive the justice he deserves. When asked about the status of the investigation all these years later, Beverly replied, quote, I have to be very honest. I've lost hope. In most cases I cover, investigators aren't exactly sure who they're looking for. Sometimes they've got eyewitness descriptions. Sometimes they've got surveillance footage. In other cases, there's physical evidence to work with, fingerprints, DNA, something that points in a direction, but with nothing to corroborate it, nothing to help define the parameters. When it comes to the murder of Al Sershira, they've got a lot of evidence. Fingerprints found at the scene, fingerprints found on the murder weapon, DNA recovered from both the scene and Al's stolen car, surveillance footage from two separate locations showing the suspect in Al's company. Parabon Labs created a composite based on that recovered DNA. Then, a partial DNA match points towards a likely relative of the killers, though that person's identity has remained sealed due to state laws regarding DNA disclosure. Essentially, they have everything except a name. For nearly 20 years now, police have been working with the same evidence, and it all points to the same person. Like I quoted from one earlier in this case, this isn't a who done it, but a who is it. They've got one person of interest, one person seen with Al in the hours leading to his death, one person's fingerprints and DNA. We've seen cases solved with far less, so the hope remains that at some point they might be able to uncover the killer's identity. I suppose the question that lingers is how this guy managed to evade authorities for the better part of two decades. They still haven't gotten a full fingerprint or DNA match which suggests a few possibilities. Either the killer's never been arrested again, has left the country, or has died. Honestly, they're all as likely as the next. Well, maybe not so much. Considering the details, this makes the theory section of this episode a little difficult to write. It's not about trying to figure out what type of person might have done this, or whether it's this person or that person. It really comes down to a single theory. That the man last seen with Al, the man who went to the grocery store with him, the man who left behind his footprint, fingerprints, DNA, and who's on surveillance footage is the killer. We just don't know who that is. So, there's only so much we can speculate about. We don't know exactly when Al met his killer, whether it was in the days leading up to his murder or maybe weeks prior to it. Police have speculated about this in one of two different ways. Either Al met this guy at a club or out somewhere, and then the two became involved, or it's possible that Al could possibly have picked him up as a sex worker. I've seen theories from investigators believing this could be connected to one of the bars or beaches that Al frequented, and I've seen them throw out the option that Al could have simply met the guy on the street somewhere, perhaps in an area where male sex workers were known to be available. 
a lot of people lean towards the latter of those theories. It's generally considered unlikely that the killer could have been hanging around a lot of those bars and clubs, and for over 20 years, not a single other person has ever recognized him and reported him to police. There's been a lot of theorizing that maybe if the killer was operating as a sex worker, his life might have been more of a drifter lifestyle without a permanent residence. But it's also possible he could have lived in the South Florida area and simply went unnoticed. The fact is, it's very difficult to determine. When it comes to the motive, police have been pretty clear on that being robbery. It's their belief that the suspect went to Al's condo with him and spent a little over a day there. Surveillance footage shows him entering the condo twice in Al's company, but there's no footage that shows him ever leaving. This either implies that the footage doesn't exist or maybe the killer knew how to get out of the building without being captured on film. We do know that he stole Al's car after killing him, abandoning it just five miles from the condo in nearby Hollywood, Florida. To me, that suggests only a handful of possibilities. Either the killer was local and abandoned the car and then walked or took public transportation home or wherever he hung out, or he knew someone else in the area and caught a ride with them. Either way, it's vastly different from the situation with Adam Azursky, who drove his victim's car more than 3,000 miles away. Azursky was looking to get out of town, and maybe Al's killer was too. But abandoning the car so close to the scene of the crime would imply he had another mode of transportation that was somewhere in the area. So, the killer goes back to Al's apartment with him, spends time hanging out, drinking, smoking, and getting a sense of the place. Multiple newspapers reported that Al had a tendency to live a bit of a fantasy life, telling guys he was rich, for instance. So maybe this guy either hears that Al has money, or he's told directly and he figures, a 76-year-old man is probably an easy mark. He's wearing a Rolex. He's driving a nice car. What turns everything brutally violent is when the killer's searching the apartment for money and valuables, but can't find any. Now he gets mad because he wasted all this time hoping that he was going to get a big score, and in the end, there's nothing to take. I should note, it seems apparent that there was some money in that apartment, but the killer never found it. An investigator made a comment to one of the newspapers saying that Al hid his money very well. It's difficult for me to believe that this was a one-off kind of crime. Considering the level of brutality used here, the fact that the killer apparently beat Al and continued questioning about money and valuables, returning to beat him more before finally stabbing him to death. That doesn't sound like the kind of crime you'd imagine being committed by someone who hasn't done something like this before. Killing someone during a struggle, stabbing someone, or even shooting them, I could kind of buy that being a one-off. But this was vicious. This was brutal. And I simply don't believe the type of person who could do this to another human being is the type who hasn't done something like it before or again. Of course, there's a consideration of the possibility of drugs. It's been speculated that the killer may have been an addict, someone who had fallen into hard times based on that addiction, becoming a sex worker to help support that habit, and the rage and anger that came boiling out of him could have stemmed more from realizing he couldn't get the money to get his hands on the drugs he wanted, more so than anything else. The Rolex, though, that would likely have fetched some decent money from a pawn shop or even could have been used in a trade for drugs. It's never turned up anywhere, but there's plenty of ways to dispose of an expensive watch that don't involve any kind of paperwork. There's a question here about premeditation. Did the killer plan all along to kill Al, and if so, does that bring the drug aspect into question, making it planned and not spur of the moment based purely on rage? It's hard to know for sure, but police definitely believe there was a lot of rage involved in the killing. While we don't know much about the killer, there's one thing which seems apparent. This guy was no expert. He left fingerprints, blood, footprints, and evidence everywhere. There didn't appear to be any attempt to cover up the crime. Frankly, I'm shocked he even abandoned the car, but maybe he figured that would be pushing it a little too far. Some have theorized the killer may have only had the intent to rob Al, assuming that the 76-year-old might be too embarrassed to report the crime. It's happened before, 
someone posing as a sex worker robs a client and gets away with it because that's an embarrassing phone call to make to police. However, in this case, something obviously went terribly wrong and Al was brutally killed. I still struggle to imagine someone who could commit such a heinous crime could be doing so simply on a whim, but crimes of passion do happen. So where does the killer go from there? According to everything we know, he basically vanished into thin air. He's never been arrested again. He's never been spotted. He's never run into police or anyone else who would have reason to fingerprint him or hold him. So I suppose you have to wonder a few different things. Is it possible that he's simply gone on with his life, never getting arrested again, and is still somewhere in the United States? That is a possibility, though it seems unlikely. Even police theorized that the person who committed this horrible crime would likely do it again. However, he could have left the country, down into Mexico, up into Canada. There are options. If that's the case, then of course he isn't going to hit on any of the systems in the United States. There is, of course, a third option, that the killer is dead, either due to a natural occurrence, his own hand, or someone else's. While police maintain their belief that they're eventually going to nail this guy, they have so much evidence it's hard to argue against that. It's been nearly 20 years and they haven't gotten anything. Well, almost nothing. The partial DNA hit in Michigan is fascinating. Based on everything investigators have shared, there's someone who was, and may still be, serving time in a Michigan prison who is in some way related to the killer. They aren't exactly sure of that relation, though they have suggested it could be a half-brother or cousin. Either way, they know the DNA they got the partial match on comes from the same family. I imagine that would be a tremendous place to begin looking, but they're not able to. Michigan doesn't allow their prison system to release the name of an inmate based on a partial match. While that may be incredibly frustrating to both investigators and Al's family, there's a lot of legal questions revolving around the use and application of DNA. Many of those systems, DNA databases and the like, which have been used in the past to make connections to killers, raise a lot of legal questions regarding privacy. At some point, we're going to see major litigation involving this process. A recent study from February of this year showed that 48% of Americans who were polled thought it was acceptable for DNA testing companies such as Ancestry and 23andMe to share customers' DNA data with law enforcement to help solve crimes. 33% of those polls were against that option, and 18% were unsure how they felt about it. In November of 2019, a Florida judge issued a warrant allowing police to search through GED Match for a potential suspect in a crime. While GED Match is used by many who approve of allowing law enforcement to use their DNA for investigations, there are some who don't. In December of 2019, Verigen, a California-based DNA analysis company, purchased GED Match, and company CEO Brett Williams made it clear that users who wish to share their data with law enforcement will be allowed to, but if police attempt to get warrants to search through the users who will not share their data, he will fight it in court, telling NBC News, quote, For me, it's about trust. If people are going to agree with the terms of service, and then those terms are violated, there is no trust here. End quote. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but it's a touchy subject and there's a lot of different views. People who share their raw DNA data have the option to share it with law enforcement or not. And whether you agree or disagree, those who elect not to share that data have a right to that privacy. I suspect there's a lot of people who haven't shared their data, not because they aren't interested in doing so, but because when it comes to DNA, people tend to be a little hesitant. What's it being used for? Who has access to it? I mean, there's leaks all the time with credit cards being stolen, so what about your DNA? It's definitely an interesting topic, which is going to come more to the forefront, I think, in the coming years. At some point, some major kind of legal precedent is going to be set. I suppose we'll find out when that happens, but I am very curious to know your opinions on the whole situation. 20 years ago, 76-year-old Al Sershiro was brutally murdered. His own daughter, a doctor, made the horrifying discovery, and it haunts her to this day. Unlike so many cases covered here, police have everything except a name, 
and for all this time that name has managed to elude them. I suppose it becomes a question of justice, about whether or not Al's family will live to see the day where his killer is identified, arrested, tried, and sentenced. For Beverly, it's become a dream that is quickly evaporating. She's waited all this time, and she knows there's a connection in Michigan, a connection which can't be revealed. While Anthony Martellato's killer was captured, and Felipe Nicholas's killer was captured, Al's is still out there somewhere. Was Al his first victim, his last, or somewhere in the middle? Has he struck again, once more escaping justice and destroying a family, or has he too met his own end? All police need is a name, and if there's one thing I'm certain of, someone has it. Someone recognizes this guy. Someone could help bring closure and justice to a grieving family. Unfortunately, until that someone comes forward, the murder of Al Sershera will remain open, unsolved, but not quite totally cold yet. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Al Sershera, there are many articles from 2001 and 2002, but they get fewer and fewer as the years go on. If you have any information about the murder of Al Sershera, please contact the Aventura Police Department at 305-466-8989. You can also leave an anonymous tip through Miami-Dade Crime Stoppers at 305-471-8477. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. I think it's important to note that October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. The United States Department of Justice estimates that 1.3 million women and 835,000 men are victims of domestic violence each year. Every nine seconds, a woman in the United States is beaten or assaulted by a current or ex-significant other. One in four men are victims of some form of violence by an intimate partner. If you or someone you love has been the victim of domestic violence, you are not alone and there is support available. You can use the Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's one 800 799-7233 or you can visit thehotline.org to talk online. All assistance is free and completely confidential with 24/7 support and resources. If you simply wish to help, you can also make a donation at thehotline.org. It's time that everyone stands up against domestic violence. Did you know that CrimeCon is coming to the United Kingdom and will be in London on June 12th and 13th, 2021? And I'll be there representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row. I'm really looking forward to being a part of this amazing event. And if you're considering going, you can use the promo code TRACE21 for 10% off your ticket. That's TRACE21 for 10% off. Visit crimecon.co.uk for more information. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our amazing Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Astrid Maria Nair, Aurora Kay, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dearthy, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Guillerme Pinto, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kate Much, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah, Sarah Mascaratolo, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tracy Woods, and Zari. You're all amazing and your contributions are greatly appreciated, as are all patrons. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash traceevidence or visit trace-evidence.com for further information. 
I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.